Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Polari Live Online. My name is Paul Burston. I've been running Polari events since 2007. Tonight, I'm joined by three diverse writers whose work explores questions of identity, sexuality, mortality, and more. Sophia Blackwell is the author of three collections of poetry and a novel. Her latest poetry collection is The Other Woman. Selena Godden is a poet, author, activist, broadcaster, memoirist, and essayist. Her debut novel is Mrs. Death, Mrs. Death. Hollis Lewis, who writes for the page, stage, and screen. His first novel, Disbanded Kingdom, was long listed for the Polari First Book Prize. His second novel, The Way It Breaks, will be published in June. Let's kick off with you, Sophia. Can you tell us a bit about the most recent poetry collection? Absolutely. So this is my most recent poetry collection, The Other Woman. And you can see on the front, um, actually a bit of explanation about why there's a picture of me and my lovely wife on the cover. This is the second poetry collection and everybody thought that the woman eating the fire was me and potentially the other woman looks a little like Helena. And we were thinking about what to put on the the next poetry collection and thought well why not have this this picture of us so this photo is taken by the lovely um christina fitzgerald morris who's also immortalized paul in lovely photos and really the reason why we're both on there is that the the other woman is very much about migrations it's about being in a relationship where one of you is white and one of you is black it's about marriage um because growing up gay i never thought that marriage would be a thing i could legally do so one of the kind of working times titles for the book was um, The Country of Marriage, but it's already been used in a variety of things. And we got to thinking about, you know, the significance of, of the other woman and being the other woman in someone else's relationship or having another woman in your own. But yeah, really, it is about marriage. It's about settling down, um, but also still continuing to explore the world, becoming an aunt and a godmother for the first time, watching my friends have kids and looking at, at the world around us, basically, and learning from it and growing. So, so that's really what the, the new collection's about. I'm going to start off with the, the title poem from, uh, from, from, from the new book. This is The Other Woman. She owns a fleece and knows the names of trees. She understands Bitcoin, blockchain and chess. Her male friends do not think of her that way. The other woman isn't much like me. The other woman gets from A to B. She chairs committees, tweets at companies. I send an emailed grievance privately. That other woman's really not like me. She studied at Life's University. She sees no need for fiction, hip hop, lipstick. People don't find her threatening at parties. Your friends all say she suits you more than me. Your parents tolerate her grudgingly. You never stuffed her past in frayed bin bags that split and spilled. She owns some property. Well, you'll never have to look for her in me. You've got a ring now and a front door key. And me, I'm good. In fact, I'm moving closer towards the woman I'd have been without you, with everything you caged in me set free. Sometimes I wonder when she'll start to doubt you. And that's one thing she'll have to share with me. Thank you. So I said I would do this poem for you, Paul, um, but uh, I'm kind of, you know how when you are, you know, back in, you know, your family life and you're surrounded by your parents, you kind of regress back to, to being a teenager. And so this poem is about mixtapes and about, you know, the joys of making mixtapes for people I was trying to get off with as, as a teenager, basically. It segues a little bit into the reading I'm going to do in part two, but this is basically about the joys of creating those uh, tokens of, of love and uh, horniness at that age, basically. I miss them, don't you? Those long Sunday nights hanging over the arm of your parents' sofa, itchy fingers poised for the end of the track. You were an explorer, marching from front to back into that vacuum, that white noise hiss, you were a general, marshalling ranks of rock stars all in your quest to get that single kiss. The language of tapes was pure interpretation. Songs were the flags you hid your face behind. Your telegraphed semaphore blurring the lines, fast forwarding in a falsetto whine, pause, skip, rewind, tongue tied through the wires, desperate as only teenagers can be. Hear me, pick 
me play click go only connect i miss them don't you sure now it's quick and clean no end of space no 90 minutes calculations and yes there's beauty even in downloaded data your memory banks decanted in an hourglass there's still the thought the careful lettering but no matter what it's just not really a party thing not a careful labor of love looped on a shoestring and i miss that kind of love that fan dance of belonging Hard to see it go, to see the tapes you own, those stacks of lovers' gifts and bugger all to play them. The buzz, the fillers and those ridiculous dates. Mix 96, 99, 01, go on, say them. Don't grieve for what you both believed. Play, go, fast forward, pause and see that single crooked heart on the sleeve. Thank you. I'm going to fit in um, another couple of short ones uh, before Paul moves on to the next guest. Uh, these two go well together, but this is basically all of the lessons in, in this short poem have stood me in good stead over the years and they've kind of, you know, helped me get through some difficult times. So while they may not all be relevant to you, I hope that some of them are. And this is basically the sum total of all of the knowledge that I've picked up in my 30 something years on this earth. It's very short and it's called how you learn. Choose the second cheapest booze, it's probably less rough. Lipstick that's not red is not working hard enough. Add a little water when your onions start to burn. You know, you think of her when you do that, but this is how you learn. Dress codes in the Middle East, the Arabic for book. Eyes or lips, not both, though you like a bolder look. Anything can shift and change, everything can turn. Never date a mama's boy or oh, girl, this is how you learn. Try not to act too try hard while eating somewhere glam. Tap water, please, the wine is fine. You think you'll have the lamb. When you're making coffee, see at the bottom of the urn, you know a guy I hated taught me that, but this is how you learn. Rinse your hair in icy water, you are not a dancer. God is in the house, but she doesn't always answer. Keep on moving forward when you know you can't return. This journey is the only one, and this is how you learn. Thank you. So I'm gonna do one more as part of this section. And this is a kind of companion piece. Um, it's about really the joys of serendipity and spontaneity, which I know that a lot of us haven't had much of over the course of the past year. But it's also basically against planning. This is my defense as to, as to why I don't plan. And it's called against bucket lists. I don't like dolphins. I have no desire to bob around in a hot air balloon. An Everest? The nausea, the tea, the Sherpas, thanks, but no. Walks by the sea, fresh ground coffee, Billy Holiday. I like the joys you wouldn't brag about, and I prefer to witness them alone with no more fanfare than a quiet sigh. See, everything I've loved has been unplanned. I could have never engineered that look that swam over her face under the lights, that six inch snow, the songs from open windows on hot Friday nights, the air awash with sex and promise, his breath on my neck, her leg flung sweetly over mine in bed, the feel of my hand in my father's hand. Thanks but I want to go to my grave surprised. I don't need to be ready or grateful. I don't even have a pen. My eyes are open, seeking the next thing while it's happening, not ticked and dated, lacquered in place like a dried butterfly while everything that's beautiful sails by. And you'll know me, you will know me, because I'll be on the corner, waiting. It's called The Way It Breaks, and it's set in my motherland of Cyprus. Uh, and it's about a young man named Orestes who wants to better his life and his life changes uh, when he comes across and meets uh, a man who works as a male escort in the five star hotels. Can you give us a, t a taste of it please? Yes I can. So this, this is from near the beginning and Orestes is um, going to a, a bar with his friend Baddies. Baddies was partial to a bar off the radar. They left his car in a dim lot overseen by a toothless old man where he squatted to play with a litter of strays. Past the trendy spot around the Banda Leon, every establishment heaving with smoking, chatting, dressed up undergrads, they went into a cafe bar in one of those vast old houses with high wooden doors and a courtyard. Baris's choice for a coffee and a game of backgammon. 
In the light of bulbs draped over a pomegranate tree, Badis did multiple things at once. He smoked, sipped an ice cold frappe, pushed his glasses up his nose, stroked another stray cat, and complained about neoliberalism without once taking his eyes off the game. He'd got first class honours in classics from UCL and could spout whole swathes of the Iliad as he scratched his beard. As a teenager, he'd needed Orestes to stand by his side to talk to girls, but now he'd forged his own path and the awkwardness of youth had transformed into a state of manly tranquility. For the first time, Orestes felt the less attractive of the two. How's your sister? Leave my sister alone, Buddy said, in that priestly drone of a voice. How would I get to her? Isn't she in London? Manchester. She's fine doing her PhD. Serious? Watch what you're doing, Ray. I'm wiping the floor with you. Eh, hey, you always win. Buddy shrugged, smoked, and lifted the frappe to his lips. He moved another chip. I saw Bavlos today, my cousin, in prison. No, you wanker, at the gym near the park. He's working there now. He said he could get me in for free. I figured I should go, you know, do some exercise, lose a bit of weight. Badis didn't take his eyes off the board. Good for you. Behind him was a painted figure stretching up the stone wall. Shadows fluttered over it. The paws of the cat spread to bat at Badis's fingers. If you want, there's a great spot to shoot some hoops. Orestes! The voice had come from behind him. He turned and Baris looked up from the game to see Evangelina Ioannidou heading towards them. Teetering on four inch heels, her body looked as simultaneously big and tiny as it had at school. She buzzed erratic, her perfume splashing everywhere. I can't believe it. When did I last see you? Where have you been? Eh, what else? Working. You? Where do you think, she said. The beach, the mall, the bar? How am I supposed to keep track? How are you doing? Fine, yeah. Remember Baris? Oh my god, Baris. I was standing there thinking, who is that Bin Laden over there? What's with the beard? Gripping their arms for balance, she bent at the waist to give each of them a peck near the cheek. Baris squirmed at her volume. What's new, Evangelina? Cut that Evangelina nonsense, she said. I'm Eva now. Haven't you seen my Facebook? You have to, it's a riot. I post selfies every day and I use those filters where you look like a painting or as if someone took it a hundred years ago. My mum says, Gori, what next? Iconography? You on the ceiling of the Hagia Sophia? Ooh, hang on. Here, you dumbass. In the courtyard, come inside, then out, past the bar. Grabbing a chair from a nearby table, Eva sat herself down with caution. There was a tight black dress, bulging bust and fabric pulling thighs to negotiate. Her body was a full cup of coffee carried on a tray over people's heads. Though Orestes had felt a twinge of dread at seeing her, the feeling subsided. Eva liked him, or at least that's what he suspected, even after he became too poor to attend their school. More than once he'd fantasized about her, of course, he never told the other guys. She was fat, they would mock him. Well, those same people would be laughing about him now, no matter what. So what if she's fat, his grandma used to say. With her dad's money, you could own a chain of hotels. The girl had a certain potency, a pull. And she made Orestes feel comfortable, desirable, even now. My next guess then I have something in common which is a personal connection to Hastings. I love Hastings I've still got quite a lot of family and friends there um, and I'm really longing to come home and see everyone um, and you get the best fish and chips. The book's called Mrs Death Mrs Death and on the very first page it says uh, mourn the dead and fight like hell for the living because that's pretty much the message of the book. So I'm just going to start by reading some. The book starts with a disclaimer because it occurred to me that when you write a book about death, that some people, everybody's got a very different idea of life and death and this and that. And, and people might write me snotty letters because I didn't get everyone in. There are so many dead people I could write about. Um, there's so many amazing lives, lives of courage 
lives of great inspiration. So it's very difficult to get that many people in such a <laughs> short book. I mean, the book would have been, but the one sort of rule with writing this book was to make it as short and beautiful and concise as possible. Um, unlike this intro, sorry. Okay, so, <laughs> so here's a little bit from the disclaimer. So the book starts boldly, just so we don't get our wires crossed. Disclaimer. This book contains dead people. This book cannot see the future. This book is dabbling in the past. This book is not about funerals, although funerals are mentioned. You do not have to wear black to read this work. You do not have to bring flowers. Caution. This work contains traces of eulogy. Warning. This work contains violent death. Spoiler alert, we will all die in the end. This book cannot change the ending or your ending or its own ending. This book does not know how to switch on the light at the end of the tunnel. This book cannot contact the other side. This book cannot speak to the dead or for the dead. This book will not confirm if there is an afterlife or an alternative universe. This book will not improve your karma this book will not nag you to live a healthier life. This book will not help you quit smoking. This book is not going to urge you to age gracefully. This book does not advocate the use of the funereal phrase, he had a good innings. This book does not contain any person or persons clapping their hands and singing, come by your my lord. This book may be used for mild to moderate relief from grief, fear and pain. However, if symptoms persist, please buy a ticket to see a live reading of this work where you will find the others. Obviously, when I wrote that, I did not picture it would be in Zoom. <laughs> like, that's just crazy. Anyway, caution, do not exceed death. This work has a very high dead or death count. Take with caution. Take your time. Do your lifetime in your own lifetime. This work calls on the righteous spirits of all of our mighty ancestors now and in the hour of our need. We take a breath and look back in amazement and wonder at how our ancestors survived so we may also survive. We take another deep breath and we feel our hearts beating inside our bodies and we celebrate that that same empowerment and spirit that runs in our blood now and can be found in our DNA today. We give thanks to our ancestors. Thanks for giving us life, for being alive, to feel alive and to share this one magnificent connection to life and all living things. This book does not contain every person that has ever died. If you wish this book to have mentioned another death, we can only apologise now in advance for not knowing which death or dead celebrity you wanted mentioned and celebrated in this book at time of writing and printing. At time of writing, this book mourns for Prince, David Bowie, Leonard Cohen, Toni Morrison and Aretha Franklin. And this book sincerely hopes there aren't any more inspirational human beings, bold souls, brave hearts and superheroes to add to that dead list before we go to print. Amen. OK, so the book sort of starts like that. I won't read any more from the disclaimer because I'd quite like you to find that for yourself. Um, and I'll read just a little bit more. This is um, Mrs. Death speaking. So this is the first bit, bit. So this is Mrs. Death speaking. Mrs. Death's diaries, the first morning of the first morning. Present day. When I called for change, did you pass by me? Did you see me today? I sit on a bench outside London's King's Cross station. I like train stations and airports best. I like to sit in places where people come and go. I sit and watch you come and go. You say goodbye and hello. Come and go. Goodbye and hello. It's as though you are not connected to each other. Goodbye, you say, clinging on to that last glance. You give a funny little wave. You don't know that you don't have to touch, to touch, to see, to feel each other. 
human beings were designed to be in contact without being in contact, to communicate without words, to call each other to each other's minds. Humans still have so much to learn about connection. But when you are in transition and whilst traveling, you are tuned into this. You are alive and alert. When you travel, you wake up. You're awake and aware of changes, differences and sameness, strangers and each other. In transit, you are occupied by time and space, by clocks and miles, by separation and reunion, your chance and your fate. Humans were built to travel. Humans were made to move, to share and to migrate, just like butterflies and birds. The history and the geography of human migration is nothing less than phenomenal. The greatest trick man played was making you believe I was a man. They erased me and made you all believe that death was male in spirit, the grim reaper in a black hood with a scythe. Remarkable that nobody questioned it really, don't you think? For surely only she who bears it, she who gave you life, can be she who has the power to take it. The one is she, and only she who is invisible can do the work of death. In this, in this book, quite a bit of the writing, um, I played with form a lot. Um, it occurred to me that when you, I wanted the reader to do some work, and it occurred to me that when you see a poem on a page, you will take a breath, you will slow down. So some of the poems are chopped up newspaper article. They are fact, they are really horrible stories, real fact. But I've laid them on a page like a poem. So instead, because when you read a nasty news story of a terrible murder, you're reading fact, you're taking in these facts. But when you read it with short lines, beautiful on a page, you will just take it more more emotionally. Um, and so I wanted to play with that a lot. Um, um, and so I, I did that a lot. So some things that started as prose turned into poems, things that started as poems turned into sort of rants or essay writing. Um, and it really occurred to me as well that we take in um, writing so so miraculously quickly nowadays. Um, we might see a news story in the morning on Twitter, okay? So we see it as a news story. By lunchtime, we're seeing it as a poem or we're hearing it as a song or a joke or a comedy or a meme. And then by the end of the day, it's a visual thing with a video. And, and so we're constantly seeing um, stories regurgitated and rehashed in different ways and in different form. Um, so it occurred to me that when Mrs. Death is hearing all the deaths in her head, that it wouldn't all be in prose form that some would be coming poems or folk songs or laments or prayers. And, and I wanted to show that in, in the writing, this kind of, this barrage of information that's coming to her, like a constant Twitter feed of different styles of writing. Often when, often when things feel like work, I'll do something else to take my mind. I like things to feel playful. So often when I've got a deadline for something, I'll go and randomly start working on something else, don't you? You know, it's like, oh, I've got an idea for a short story. And then the essay that's meant to be in tomorrow is screaming at me. You know, I think we I think we all do that as writers. I think of myself as a baker. I've got some things in the oven and I've got some things in the shop window. It's like I have a little bakery here. Like this is in the shop window, but there's all kinds of things marinating or or things that can get taken out of the freezer and defrosted and have another, have another look at them. and. Yeah, never throw anything away is, is the idea, isn't it? Just keep, because something might, that, that you couldn't finish once and then you go back to it and you're like, ah, with like a new fresh eye, you can sort of, you know, rework it. And, yeah, like sourdough, just keeps going. <laughs> <laughs> Another theme of lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah. so is 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 the novel more like a sort of family sized loaf, and and a book of poetry is kind of, you know, <laughs> a collection of buns uh, <laughs> or bagels? Well, to be honest with you, I didn't think I'd let anyone read this because I I just thought it was uh yeah I, I kind of this was something that I was working on sort of over the last decade. So it's while I was making the Live Wire album and doing the Good Immigrant stuff and and the Pessimism is for Lightweight stuff and all these other projects. And this was the thing I was working on secretly, you know, um, to avoid deadlines. 